John Lund as Johnny Dollar. This is Johnny Pantella, missing person. You telephoned this office about you, Brick Bain, did you? That's right. Insurance? Is that your business? I'm an investigator. Oh, I see. I was sent here by the company that wrote the bonding policy on Brisbane's firm. We heard he'd been reported missing. Well, that's about it. Mrs. Brisbane filed a complaint with us last night. But how'd you hear about it so fast? Now, one of Brisbane's clients happened to be one of our insurance brokers. He reported it to us. Oh. Any leads? Nothing so far. Uh, I'm going out to talk with Mrs. Brisbane in a little while. If you'd like to come along, you're welcome. Fine. <laughs> We'll return to our program in a moment. But first, I'd like to say a few words about jamming. And I don't mean Mother's Preserve. During wartime, it has frequently been the practice of an enemy country to jam our radio communication. That is, to cut into our broadcasting with broadcasting of their own so that our radio messages cannot be received with any degree of clarity. There was a time when our civilian radio broadcasts were jammed too unintentional though it was. As you can imagine, it was quite a mess, and still could be. Can you imagine what would happen today if there was no coordination among our many radio and TV stations? Or if the telephone companies didn't cooperate? When radio broadcasting first began in our country, each station chose its own call letters, power, and spot on the dial. It wasn't long before... Two or three stations would try to come in on the same spot, and the poor listener couldn't understand a thing he heard. So, to get things organized, the Federal Communications Commission was born. Licenses were issued to each station and to qualified operating engineers. The same thing now applies to TV stations. Today, a radio or TV station may request certain call letters, and if no one else has them, the call letters are issued. But power and the spot on the dial are restricted by laws of nature. And the FCC engineers don't have much choice in what they tell the station operator he can or cannot do. With the telephone and telegraph, however, the situation is different. The FCC makes sure the rates are fair both to the company and to the consumer. And that all of the independent companies work together so that someone in Japan or Germany, for example, can call someone else in New York with practically no delay or trouble. So the next time you pick up a stateside broadcast, loud and clear, or hear everything your family says to you over the telephone, just remember that you have the Federal Communications Commission to thank. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Cosmopolitan Bonding and Insurance Corporation, Cosmopolitan Insurance Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Brisbane fraud matter. Expense account item one, $91.35. Airfare and incidentals between Hartford and Detroit. Item two, $25 even. Legal fee. Before I met Sergeant Pantella, I engaged attorney Robert E. Pearson to arrange for a court order impounding all the records and books in the offices of Hugh Brisbane's small brokerage house. However, I moved an hour too late on that procedure. When I met Sergeant Pantella at the police station, he told me. We'd have to look at them first, Dollar. DA's office got out a court order first thing this morning. Well, I wasn't trying to jump you, Sergeant. I didn't know how far you'd gotten Just that we're always anxious to get that information on a case like this, so our auditors can get busy. Yeah, it's a $25,000 bond, and we'll have to make good on it if Brisbane's run away. We don't know if he's done that, Dollar. No, we don't. What are your ideas on this, Sergeant? Well, I only talked with Mrs. Brisbane briefly. She told us she hadn't been home for two days. That was last night. The family doctor had already been there and given her a sedative. That's why I had to wait until this morning to get some details. I see. I have four men covering Brisbane's office force right now, and the DA's men are there, of course, on the books. I will be glad to give you a copy of their findings, maybe save your people some money. Hmm. Almost 11. Now, what do you say? Anytime. Forty minutes later, I was in the living room of the Brisbane home with Sergeant Pantella. Hugh Brisbane's wife was settled on a sofa in front of the fireplace. She was a small, stocky woman in her late 30s or early 40s. The clothes she was wearing, the house itself, the appointments of the room about her, all suggested a well-run, well-kept sort of life. Of course. Sergeant Pantella, isn't it? Yes. 
And this is Mr. Dollar from the insurance company. Yes. I represent the company that bonded Mr. Brisbane's firm. Oh, really? Naturally, we're interested in his whereabouts, too. Well, is there anything wrong? We don't know. It's just a matter of routine right now. I feel much better today, Sergeant. I hope I can be of some help. Mrs. Brisbane, on a case like this, there are standard questions that we want answered. Now, some of them are personal, but the information is necessary if we're going to proceed with any efficiency. Oh. I wanted you to understand that. Now, last night when I spoke with you, you said you hadn't seen or talked to your husband for two days. That's right. I saw him at breakfast Tuesday morning, and that was the last time. Did you know that after he left here, Mr. Brisbane did not go to his office? No. He wasn't there at any time Tuesday or Wednesday, as far as we can find out. Uh, did he take a car? No. He preferred the bus when the weather was like this. About what time did you have breakfast with him Tuesday? Oh, before nine sometime. He always tried to be in his office by 10.30. I don't want to frighten you, but can you think of any enemies that might want to do your husband harm? Enemies? You? Oh, dear, no. We'd appreciate it very much if you'd consider that question again, Mrs. Brisbane. It's important. I really can't think of anyone who might want to hurt him. Or perhaps in his office, in his business, there's someone, but he never discussed what went, what went on there with me. Are you sure? It was a rule. See, this is our home. That is his business. We just never talked about what went on in his office at all. Mm, I see. How long have you and Mr. Brisbane been married? Eighteen years, next July. Well, can you think of any reason why Mr. Brisbane might just walk out and not come back? None whatsoever, Sergeant. Absolutely none. You said that you saw your husband last uh, Tuesday morning at breakfast? Yes. But you didn't report him missing until last night. Can you explain that? Well, I wasn't here for dinner Tuesday night, and when I got home it was late in the evening. I presumed he was in his room sleeping. Wednesday, I was also out for dinner and came in late. It wasn't until dinner time Thursday that I became worried. I telephoned his office and they said he hadn't been in for two days. Then I telephoned the police. Had his bed been slept in at all? No. The maid told me that she hadn't made it since Tuesday morning. Well, weren't the people in his office worried? I suppose so. Well, I mean, didn't someone there telephone here asking for Mr. Brisbane? Oh, no. Sometimes he wouldn't be in the office for two or three days at a time. He instructed the secretary that when he didn't show up, he didn't want to be called at home either. I see. Where would he spend his time on these occasions when he didn't go to his office for a couple of days? Here. She would like to read and write a little. He has a room on the third floor where he spent a great deal of his time. Would it be possible to look at that room? Oh, yes, I suppose so. Well, tell me, have you, have you looked through his bedroom? Yes. Any of his things missing? Not that I know of. Clothes, luggage, something like that. I really couldn't say. I don't know enough about his things. Well, how about the servants? Could they give us that information, do you think? Possibly, possibly. Miss Brisbane, have you had any odd telephone calls or messages since your husband's disappearance? No. What do you mean? Well, again, we don't want to frighten you, but there's always the possibility that he was kidnapped. He's being held for ransom. Oh, dear Lord. Well, I, I wouldn't worry about that angle too much if you haven't had any contact. Did uh, Mr. Brisbane drink much? Cocktails before dinner, maybe two or three. Ever any long drinking, Johns? Uh, no. Oh, on a weekend occasionally, but nothing serious. Hugh never went off and drank, if that's what you're trying to find out. Is he in good health? Yes, perfect, I think. Uh, who's your family doctor? Dr. Weiner took care of you. L.D. Weiner. Okay. Now, we won't keep you much longer, Mrs. Brisbane, uh, but about the clothing. Mr. Brisbane was wearing Tuesday morning. A dark blue suit, gray hat, gray tweed overcoat. Is that correct? Yes. I remember very distinctly. We talked to Mrs. Brisbane for another half hour, gathering information concerning the missing man. After that, we questioned both servants and learned that Brisbane was a man of careful and precise habits. We examined the study that Mrs. Brisbane had told us about, as well as his bedroom. To all appearances, and from all we could learn, he had taken nothing with him but the clothes on his back and what money he had on his person. By mid-afternoon, every member of Hugh Brisbane's office force had been interviewed and questioned. None of them were able to furnish a motive behind his sudden and complete absence. He was described by everyone as a model husband and a model business executive. 
A detail from the district attorney's office reported that his business was in sound financial condition. I went with Sergeant Pantella when he interviewed Dr. Weiner, Brisbane's personal physician. Well, according to my records, I examined him last on December 13th. He was in good health. For a man of his age and responsibility, I would say he was in excellent health. Well, could you explain the qualification, Doctor? Well, I was thinking only by comparison. Hugh Brisbane is 45 years old. He's held a position of tremendous responsibility for many years. For a lesser man or a frailer man, the incidence of an organic disturbance increases with the years. In Brisbane's case, it didn't seem to hold. He knew how to relax. Or he knew how to escape for periods of time and get a complete rest. He told me that he read a great deal and tried his hand at writing. Did you, uh, did you do a complete physical on him, Doctor? Uh, yes. Why? Was there any indication or any reason whatsoever for you to suspect that he might suffer from some sort of mental trouble? No, there, there was not. I'd say that when I examined him, he was in excellent mental shape, too. Oh, I know you're seeking out the possibility of an amnesia condition or something similar. No, it wouldn't come in a flash just like that. There would have been some symptoms. What kind of symptoms? Well, symptoms that Mrs. Brisbane or the people in his office would have noticed and probably told you about when you questioned them. An inability to remember names, addresses, telephone numbers are the most easily recognized. Someone would have picked up those things in his conversation or his actions. For instance, he might have not been able to count his change when he paid a check at a restaurant. See what I mean? Mm, I see, yes. I think you can discount the probability of amnesia on those grounds. How long have you known him, Doctor? Well, six years, I think. He used to go to a friend of mine who passed away, and then he came to me. Did you ever meet him outside this office? Socially, yes. Where? Well, we both belong to the same country club. I played golf with him several times. I've seen him at dances, other affairs. Did he and uh, Mrs. Brisbane strike you as a happy couple? Oh, I suppose so, Mr. Dollar. I never really thought about it much. Uh, I'll tell you this. Hugh Brisbane has quite a head on his shoulders. That was always my impression of him. Did you ever have occasion to talk with him about anything but business or social activity? Yes, I did. Once. It startled me at first. I, I was aware that he was a man of education in some culture, but I was quite taken aback by his ability to quote the classicists. Oh? It seemed incongruous somehow. I, I remember... We were sitting in the club. Uh, it had been a two o'clock lunch. Practically everybody had left except the waiters. And I heard him quote a Greek. Callicles. Uh, what did he quote? Do you remember it? Why? Just, just curious. Well, I don't remember it, but I was so impressed with the passage, I took the trouble to look it up myself and to write it down. I have it here somewhere. Ah, yeah. There it is, Mr. Dollar. Thanks. Huh. Surprising, hmm? I don't know. What does it say? But if there were a man who had sufficient force, he would shake off and break through and escape from all this. He would trample underfoot all our formulas and spells and charms and all our laws which are against nature. The slave would rise in rebellion and be lord over us. And the light of natural justice would shine forth. Huh. When did he quote this to you, Dr. Weiner? Monday, the day before he disappeared. John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The disappearance of Hugh Brisbane had been complete and final up until the time the district attorney's men discovered that $5,000 had been withdrawn from his savings account on the morning he'd vanished. The fact that he was known to have a large amount of money with him opened up new possibilities in the case. What was his name? Uh, Cook. This is the third case. Oh, yeah. Over there. Hmm? Yeah. Mr. 
Mr. Cook? Yes? I'm Sergeant Pantera. This is Mr. Dollar. Oh, yes. You phoned me. It's about uh, Mr. Brisbane. You took care of him when he was in here last Tuesday. Is that right? Yes, I handled the withdrawal. We'd like to see the slip on that, please. Yes, I uh, I looked it up. I have it ready for you. Thanks. You uh, said on the phone you'd want a copy? Yes, for the handwriting man. Well, you may have that one. There was an automatic duplicate when he made out the withdrawal slip. We have that for our file. I see. Uh, have you known Mr. Brisbane very long? Well, I've seen him the many times he's been in the bank since I've worked here. How long is that? Five years. Are you sure you know him? Oh, yes, of course. Is this him? Why, yes. This is the same man who signed this withdrawal slip last Tuesday morning. That's right. Mm-hmm. Okay, now tell us. What well, happened? He uh, just came up to the cage and gave me the withdrawal slip. That's all. I see. Well, weren't you a little surprised when he made out a withdrawal slip for $5,000? No, not particularly. Well, that's a lot of money. Oh, well, maybe I was a little surprised, but Mr. Brisbane has withdrawn large sums from his personal savings account several times. Uh, yes, I remember once he took out uh, $3,500, and another time he withdrew $2,000. Uh, I assume this was for some sort of speculation where he needed cash on hand. When he came up to the cage, what exactly did he say to you? Oh, uh, just good morning, and will you please take care of this? Is that all? Yes, that's all. Well, didn't he stipulate how he wanted the money? Tens, twenties, hundreds? Oh, oh yes, he did say that. He took it mostly in hundreds and fifties. Uh, I think I gave him two hundred dollars worth of tens and twenties, too, but I'm not sure. Any of those bills happen to be recorded? No, no, I'm sorry. $5,000 is quite a bundle of money to be carrying around broken down that way, Mr. Cook. Oh, he was ready for it. He had a small bag with him. He, he put it all in that. What kind of a bag? Oh, just a bag, like a doctor's bag. It was black or very dark brown, I think. Mm -hmm. Anything else you can remember about it? No, I'm afraid not. Initials, maker's name? No, sorry. Okay. Dollar? Yeah, just one minute. When Brisbane left the bank with a bag of money, did you happen to see which way he went? Oh, no. Okay. Oh, uh, wait. I don't know if this is important, but uh, come to think of it, I, I did notice something peculiar about him that day. Oh, what? Well, usually when we did business, he'd be very brisk about it. I mean, he'd hurry away from the cage, but last Tuesday he didn't seem to be in any hurry at all. I had the distinct feeling Mr. Brisbane didn't particularly care in what direction he went somehow. Check with Mrs. Brisbane and the house servants established that Brisbane had not left the house carrying the bag described by the bank teller. A supplementary information bulletin was issued, including a description of the bag. Meanwhile, Sergeant Pantella's men continued the routine check of bus, train, and plane terminals within the city. Still no luck. Oh, I'm afraid he had too good a start, Dollar. He, he could be in Europe by now. Yeah. Well, what does your company think of all this? Well, as long as his books are in good shape, the insurance company can breathe a little easier. But they're still worried about him. I phoned Mrs. Brisbane and told her she could bring charges against him for desertion if she wanted to. That way we'd get a little more action from the other cities. She said she didn't want to do that. Mm-hmm. On that savings account, it was a joint account, wasn't it? Yeah, but he only took 5000 That leaves her 23 hmm. Well, he's really done a good job if he was trying to get away. With that much money on him, somebody else could have done a good job, too. Yeah. Sergeant Pantella, missing person. What's your name? I know where it is. Right. Well, at least we know he was alive Tuesday night. Oh. That was a man who runs a bar over on Motor Avenue. He said Brisbane was in there Tuesday night. Him. That's a picture of the guy who was in here Tuesday night. Are you sure? Sure, I'm positive. Was he with anybody? Uh, all alone, sat right down there on that stool. How long was he here? Oh, he was here when I come on. He was still here when the place closed. Did you happen to see where he went from here? Uh, what kind of shape was he in? Was he drunk? No, real sober and quiet. He drank all night, but it didn't seem to affect him at all. Well, did you talk to him at all? No, I just took his orders for drinks. He didn't seem to want to talk to nobody. I see. What time did you come on? Uh, eight o'clock. What time do you close? Two. Did you happen to notice if anybody who was in here talked to him? Oh, I think a couple of people tried, you know, drunks, but he didn't have much to say to them, so they just left him alone. Uh-huh. Anything else happen? No. 
Oh, right. Yeah, he, he was making a phone call all the time he was here. A long-distance phone call from that booth right there. He sat at the end of the bar so he could hear the operator call him back. You don't happen to know where he was calling? No. Oh. How do you know it was a long-distance call? Oh, because once he handed me a 20 and asked me to change it, I gave him $5 worth of quarters. All the quarters I had, as a matter of fact. Uh-huh. About what time was this? Well, I couldn't say exactly. It seemed to be about 10 o'clock when he started. You mean when he first placed the call? That's right. But he was still at it after midnight. I guess the operator was ringing him every 20 minutes the way they do, you know. Do you know if he completed the call? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard him slugging quarters into the box once. Mm. Okay. Did he have anything with him while he was here? Oh, what do you mean? Was he carrying a bag or anything? No, nothing but his overcoat. company records disclosed that Hugh Brisbane had placed a call from the pay booth in the lounge. A person-to-person -person call to a Kenneth Temple in San Francisco. We tried to place a call to the same number, but there was no answer. I'm sorry, sir. Your party does not answer. I'll call you back in 20 minutes. All right, miss. Kenneth Temple. Temple? Something familiar? Something, yes. I don't know what it is, though. Well, we should be hearing from the police there pretty soon. I asked them to look him up. We waited another two hours trying to complete the call to Kenneth Temple in San Francisco. The operators were still trying when we drove out to the Brisbane residence once more. Mrs. Brisbane led us into the house. You say you found out something, Sergeant? Well, we might have, Mrs. Brisbane. Maybe you can help us. I'll try. Won't you sit down? Thanks, thanks. Now, what is all this about San Francisco? We found out that your husband called a man named Kenneth Temple there on Tuesday night. Oh? That name, Kenneth Temple, does it does it mean something to you? No. Have you ever heard it before? I don't believe I have. Mr. Brisbane never mentioned it to you at all? I can't say for certain, but it's not familiar to me at the moment. <sighs> Mrs. Brisbane, have you ever been to San Francisco? Yes. When? Twice. Going to and coming back from Hawaii two years ago. Has Mr. Brisbane ever been in San Francisco? He was on the same trip. The name Temple. Maybe it's someone you met while you were there? No. I don't recall meeting anyone there at all. We were in the group of people. We all took the same plane from here and stayed together the whole trip. I see. Oh, excuse me, please. Sure. This isn't getting us very far. I don't get it. Hello. Who? Oh, yes, operator. Just a moment. It's uh, for you, Sergeant. Oh, thanks, thanks. Probably San Francisco. Thank you. This is Sergeant Fantella. Yes? Hello, Mr. Temple. This is Sergeant Fantella, Missing Persons Division, Detroit Police Department. We're trying to locate a man named Hugh... Br All right. He's there now. You, let me talk to you. Just a minute, Mrs. Brisbane. Mr. Brisbane, we've been pretty worried about you. Yes, I'm speaking to you from your home. She's fine. Yeah, just a moment. He wants to talk to you. Hello, Hugh. Oh, it's so good to hear your voice. Hugh, what on earth is... Yes, Hugh, I'm listening. Yes. Yes, you. I remember all that. But you, I... Yes, dear. All right. You again. Oh. Hello, Brisbane. Yes. Yes, I understand. Are you feeling all right, Mrs. Brisbane? I... I'll catch my breath. Sure, that was your husband you talked to? It was you. I'm leaving you and everyone else. <laughs> That's what he said. What? Well, he said that he was going to take a long sea trip with Mr. Temple... And that he wouldn't be back for a year. If he ever came back. 
He said he wrote me all of this in a letter that I should receive today. Why would he do a thing like that? He had everything here in his home that he wanted. It's a lovely home. We have lovely friends. Why? Why? If you were to just talk to me about it. I don't... Maybe he did, Mrs. Brisbane. What? A doctor's the only one I found who ever listened to him. Brisbane had just plain walked out one day and had no intention of coming back for a long, long time. And as far as the police were concerned, there was no way to stop him. As far as we're concerned, we'll have to sit on that $25,000 bond and hope that he'll come back to Detroit someday when he gets whatever it is out of his system. Nothing we can do either. Expense account item three. Room and board of the chase. $78.50. $78.50. Item four, same as item one, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $286.20. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar stars John Lund in the title role and was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Jay Novello, Jeanette Nolan, John McIntyre, Joe Kearns, and Virginia Gray. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. 